entrepreneurs don't wait for governments, they don't wait for the private sector, and they don't wait for the customer. You're pushing barriers, you're pushing through these barriers to try and make things better for the world. And I think the government, not just ours, but all around the world are struggling to catch up to the pace of this innovation. Welcome to Velocitize Talks. I'm Andy North, and today our guest is Nabil Charanya, Chairman and CEO of Rocker Inc. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. With so many people coming online, which would be an estimated three billion, how do you see the infrastructure adapting and changing even at a local or global level for entrepreneurs, uh, investors, innovators, etc.? So, I, I mean, that's an excellent question because you just take last year as a you know as a milestone, 250 million people came online last year alone taking the number online already to 4 billion people. 3 billion more people in the next five years. That is really going to be about 90% of the world's population. So the first thing people think about when they say, okay, 7 billion people are going to be online, is they say, okay, that's trillions of dollars of commerce. And that, while that's true, what people fail to realize is that the fabric of the way society functions is going to change. And, you know, just simple examples. So and I mean, I can't give you names, but we were talking to a big brand, you know, the other day. And they said, you know what? We have a hundred million customers. We're, we're going to be safe forever. And, and then you sit down and you look at the numbers and you say to them, guys, you realize a hundred million people with seven billion people online is not even a niche market. Brand loyalty is going to disappear because you have seven billion people reviewing your product in real time. So just because your parents bought Dove soap and their parents before them bought Dove soap doesn't mean, you know, that kid is going to buy Dove soap, right? So, you know, it affects basically the way we think society is going to function and in a, in a variety of ways. So while there is trillions of dollars of commerce, what we see is basically a global intelligence that is going to actually come to the forefront for the first time in human history. And to explain that, we have to take one step back. So we, we use the word exponential technologies a lot, right? Um, but what does it really mean? So, and I use this analogy all the time. You know, if I took 30 steps, linear steps, I would probably make it around, you know, halfway around this room. If I took 30 exponential steps where each step doubled, you know, I would walk around the earth 27 times. And that acceleration or that speed is what is happening to technology including the internet, right? So for the first time in human history, you know, we've had moments before, the Industrial Revolution, the Gutenberg Press, moments which created knowledge. So the Gutenberg Press, the reason it's a big moment is for the first time, not just the upper class, everybody had access to knowledge, to information. That's what the internet is doing, right? For the first time ever, we're democratizing access to information. And for the first time in history, we have multiple Gutenberg Press moments happening at the same time. Because while as humans, we haven't had a software upgrade in 50 million years, we're able to create exponential technologies like the blockchain, like artificial intelligence, like robotics, like drones, like nanotech. I mean, we I mean, if you just go on YouTube, you can watch videos of kids in their garage experimenting with CRISPR, a DNA sequencing technology, right? So, what we believe is what's happening is for the first time, the world is getting access to all the information that for the last 400 years or so was kind of trapped in the Western world. So, and what I mean by that is today, a kid in Bombay or in you know, Manila or Bogota or Nairobi has access to the same TED Talks, has access to iTunes University, has access to the Stanford on online education course, to YouTube, and they can learn the same things that a kid in a privileged society can learn. So the world's intelligence is not only increasing, but it's becoming more evident, right? Things like, you know, finding superstars on YouTube. You could have been an amazing singer even 50 years ago, 15 years ago, and you would just never have been discovered because there was no access. But now with that access, you're finding these little gems all over the world. So the access to the internet is changing fundamentally how the world is going to build the future. Because now for the first time you have everybody with access to the same information who can work together to build new things. 
And that second part, working together, is also a big change. So, you know, it's been said for decades, you know, the world is small, you know, we're becoming smaller and smaller, but for the first time, it's actually feasible to work together. Video conferencing, right, telephones, I mean, it's improving at such a pace that that distance, that barrier is becoming very, very slim, right? So, for example, you know, if we're working on, and these are real examples, we're working on a, a drone project for basically using computer vision to analyze how crops are reacting or, you know, are being damaged by different weather phenomenon and um, pests. The computer vision expert for that, for a project in Latin America, was someone we found in Poland, right? And it's because we have access to all these experts and we can validate who they are, we can test them, we can know how much they know, and we can match them with a project that's happening, you know, thousands of miles away, is what's creating this innovation cycle that before wasn't possible. So the, the three billion people coming online is a fascinating, you know, change in the way you, you think society is going to function. It's interesting, and that leads me down the road of, so you've got all this phenomenal technology and, and the connectivity to access it. What about the investment side? What about the financial side? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of cryptocurrencies that, yeah. are, that are popping up and, and going away uh, all at the same time. You've got Warren Buffett saying cryptocurrency is a thing of the past. What is your take on it? How do you see the money connecting with the technology? Well, with all due respect, I think you know crypto and digital currencies are the future. Um, for all the reasons we just mentioned, they're barrierless, they're global, and just like with you know things in the past that people gravitated to because it allowed them to function in society the way they needed to, it is taking off and it took off from the ground level up, right? So the blockchain is really what we think is the most interesting piece about this technology, right? So the crypto craze is real. Um, you know, people are making and losing tons of money every day and unfortunately there are bad actors in the space. But the blockchain technology itself that is the, the ground level or the root of creating these cryptocurrencies is actually a transformational technology. The ability for a currency to have um, intelligence built into its, it, you know, the core of what it functions as provides a unique way for transactions to grow and scale, right? So the ability, even from a real estate perspective, you think about simple things, titles, right? I mean, in the, in the third world, especially, or in the developing world, land grabs, you know, or proving that you own a piece of land that's been in your family for hundreds of years can be impossible if someone just decides to step in and, you know, take it, right? There's no titles, there's no paperwork, you know. So crypto, in that sense, if it's a coin or if it's a token that leverages the blockchain technology to provide additional um, utility or functionality around what the transaction is, is a very powerful thing. I mean, companies like IBM, I'm not sure if you know this, just a few weeks ago, came out with a computer that's the size of a grain of rice, right? And, and it's a blockchain-enabled computer because they want to use these computers, mini computers, microcomputers, to basically um, automate and digitize the entire supply chain. So you know where all your goods are, you know, who's touched them, what ports they've been in, wherever it is. I mean, those changes are transformational if you think about traditional industries, right? So while there is a craze and, and you know, we, we, I think there's a need for some regulation and there's a need for some room for innovation. And if those two things occur, I think the explosion in terms of the usage of blockchain and crypto is going to be faster than most people think. And, and I, I want to go down that road a little bit further. Uh, what are some of the technologies that you are excited about? Obviously, blockchain being yes. one. We've got AI, yeah. uh, VR, many of these I'm sure you're probably in, involved with yes. uh, through Rocket Labs. What do you see on the horizon? What are you excited about? So I think artificial intelligence is, is really one of the key areas that we are, we're excited about and focusing on. And, you know, artificial intelligence is not easy. You know, everybody throws a term around. But it encompasses a lot of different factors to allow you to actually, you know, have an artificial intelligence system, product, platform, ecosystem. So it's closer than people think, but there are still technologies, access, platforms that need to be worked out. I mean, you have startups that can now access Watson 
from IBM wherever they are, which is an amazing, you know, improvement from even two or three years ago. But artificial intelligence is one of those technologies that relies on data, on, on machine learning, you know, other areas that if they work together become a very interesting, unique opportunity. And that's where we are most excited about is the intersection of these exponential technologies. So if you think about artificial intelligence on its own, you know, it's like, is this Terminator? You know, is this like the, you know, what scenario are we looking at? But if you think about artificial intelligence analyzing decades of medical data to now help us predict illness or predict cures, that's an interesting implementation of two exponential technologies, right? So while we're not in the business of building, for example, say the next 3D printer, but if we can leverage AI, big data, and blockchain for a company to basically do just-in-time printing of clothing, that's a unique business opportunity that wouldn't have existed even three years ago. So the intersection of these technologies is what's most exciting to us. And there are, I mean, like I said, there's probably 12 or so of these exponential technologies that we monitor at any given moment. But blockchain, artificial intelligence, we're, we're looking a lot at nanotechnology now in various different senses from microbots to, uh, you know, to healthcare applications. But there's a lot of, you know, um, innovation that is occurring in these spaces. And we're keeping an eye out on, on, on a lot of those areas. Let's talk a little bit about the the some of these market trends that that you're seeing coming coming down the line, uh, both in terms of investment and technology. Uh, what are some of the exciting ones that that have you interested in that you're monitoring? So the way I look at the future investment or future up investment is in two ways. One is that for the first time, I think investors, and by investors I mean the end investor, the ultimate investor, is going to have access to data about an asset class, the early stage startups, that they never had before. You know, before it was like, do I know somebody in a, in a VC fund or, you know, can I get into one of these funds or do I know somebody that has a great idea? But the data that we are now able to gather around startups, about, around innovation, just from our ecosystem alone and the data we can track is becoming very useful from an investment perspective. And the second trend that you cannot ignore is basically the whole secure tokenization of startups or the ICO trend or the token generation trend. And the reason that's fascinating is I think it's, it stems from a need for startups around the world to act, you know, to attract capital from investors that were never able to connect with these startups, right? So while there are scams that are occurring or there are, you know, people that just, you know, want to raise millions of dollars on an idea, as this system evolves, you're going to have the combination of a lot of great data, a lot of validation mechanisms, a lot of regulation, but ultimately for the good, because for the first time, I think investors will be able to access innovation directly. And that's why even from our perspective, from a fund perspective, we're very cognizant of the fact that tokenization, um, access to investors, um, that are global and access to ideas that are global needs to be the way we think about investing, not in the future, but today. So from an ecosystem perspective, we're leveraging everything from our education platforms to our co-build platforms to our expert networks from around the world. The blockchain in terms of tokenization of security so that our funds and our public market investors have direct access with data into the companies that we're trying to build, which allows them to be much more comfortable about what they're investing in. So, you know, the, the issue becomes people want to jump in to buying ICOs or buying into these tokens, but they don't really have the expertise to validate it. And truth to be told, it's not going to be your financial advisor who has that expertise, right? Because, I mean, they just were not educated in one, how startups are built or work or how the blockchain works or how tokenization works. So the rise of company builders, the rise of, you know, people that are able to actually for the first time validate the technology for you, to validate the market applied to the technology, the intersection of these technologies become the valuable, you know, commodities in terms of accessing the right investments. So I think it's going to become a global investment paradigm. I think the governments are going to have a hard time catching up. 
Uh, you think about in the, you know, I mean, we have prototypes of this. You could be on a plane, you know, from here to Nairobi, and you can say, I'm interested in blockchain technology, drone technology, and you get an alert on your phone saying there's a great startup that's been validated by 200 experts around the world. You can, you can invest as little as $100 or, you know, $100,000, and you do it from a click on your phone because everything is, is on the blockchain, securitized, and you're able to do that. How do governments track that? Right? It's an interesting thing to try and figure out, but yeah, I think they're going to play catch up. Uh, and that's where I was, you mentioned regulation a couple yeah. times, and it, it seems to be the third leg of the stool. Yes. Bit. You've got the technology, you've got the investment, what about the regulation? Is that, is that a, a lagging factor in all this? I think it's a lagging factor in all of this, and you know, it's, it's a, I think it's a theme that we have to be aware of. Entrepreneurs don't wait for governments, they don't wait for the private sector, and they don't wait for the customer. You're pushing barriers, you're pushing through these barriers to try and make things better for the world. And I think the government, not just ours, but all around the world are struggling to catch up to the pace of this innovation. The, the, the archaic systems we have in place to moderate, regulate, and protect ultimately the end, you know, investor need to be updated quickly. And I think there, uh, the governments are struggling to react because the whole concept around the blockchain is a decentralized economy. And you're coming from a centralized you know, point of control to try and regulate a global economy. So the paradigm you know, between both doesn't work from the get-go. So I think they're going to have to change their mindset a bit. Otherwise, people are going to continue to innovate. And the last thing you want is another Silk Road or you know, you know, those types of technologies or the use of the technology to, for, for bad. So I think the governments just have to change their mindset and work with the entrepreneurs, work with the innovators to create systems for regulation for the future. So speaking of that, let's talk a little bit about GDPR as, yeah. as, as an example. Yes. Uh, you've got the EU sort of leading the world yes. there, uh, which is interesting. I think it would take a while for the U.S. to get yeah. there. But it's affecting the world. Yes. Anyone that does business with any European yes. company. What, are you, what is your take on GDPR, and, and do you see it as good, bad? I completely part of support the it because we, you know, we talked earlier about the three billion extra people coming online. The power needs to be with the people. If I don't want my information, you know, shared anywhere, or I want to be able to control it once I pass away, or you know, who has access to that information, I should have that power. Companies have benefited long enough from leveraging our information to create businesses for themselves. It's time for the people to have a little bit more control on how that functions. So I fully support the initiative. I fully support the effort. And I think other governments are going to have to catch up to it because that's what the, you know, that, that's what you would want. That's what I want. So I have no problem sharing my information in certain cases, but I want to control when, how much, and who benefits from it. So I think those type of regulations benefit innovation because Ultimately, you're doing what the end consumer wants, right? And I think access to your own data is critical in the type of future we're moving towards, where there is no hiding from anybody. So I think it's actually good, and, and I hope there's more of that type of innovate, you know, innovation, really, from the regulation side of things to help people build better and secure futures around the Internet. It would seem to be enabling, as you said, enabling a better, more secure future. Because if this, if all of this technology and all this investment is meeting, you've got a heck of an opportunity there. But you want to make it secure. Yeah. You don't want pirates or hackers or whatnot accessing it. So something like GDPR or what may come next, next. seems to be enabling that. And I would assume that it also would be beneficial to your companies as well. I think so, and I think you know ultimately for companies to start playing with this new understanding that. Ultimately, data is not free, right? There's a cost either to the end consumer or to the person paying for it, but data should not be free, especially if it's your own personal data, right? So I think it definitely helps companies to realize that you cannot go down this path, you know, being a pirate, basically, and you have to play nice in this new playground so you know the rules. And I think that's the big thing with entrepreneurs is you need to know the rules and you need to know what boundaries you can push. Right, otherwise there is no innovation. But you don't want to stray too far on the other side, as long as you know where the lines are. My guest today has been Nabil Charanya with Rocker Incorporated. 
And Bill, thank you so much. You've been fantastic. Thank you. Really appreciate it.